Playing blue play a lot of counter spells, having ways to do with things. <laughs> Not I'm a lot of counter spells. <laughs> Lots of counter spells. <laughs> but you want twenty <laughs> plus counter spells. <laughs> Whoops! All counter spells. <laughs> counter spell tribal. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Command Value Podcast. I think this is episode number four. Today we're going to be kind of adding on to our last episode. Uh, last episode, if you haven't seen it, we talked about the six-fold ways of building a commander deck, like just a basic rundown of how to select 100 cards to play and just kind of the basics on how to get started. Today we're gonna be diving in a little bit more, exploring a little bit more of that. Um, we're gonna be talking about five things that you can do to make your deck stronger. A lot of the things are gonna be very similar to the, the six-fold path, but we're gonna go into details about these specific things that you can do if if you wanna make your deck stronger. And we just wanted to very much reiterate the fact that this these points are gonna be for people who want to make their decks stronger. A lot of times, maybe you have a deck that you like the way that it is. Maybe it's supposed to be a jank deck. And if you're not looking to make it more efficient or stronger, then these points may not be super relevant to you. But if you ever sat down at a, at a pod at your local game store, if you've ever been with your friends playing, and you've just noticed that your deck doesn't get off the ground, you're sitting in top deck mode, or you've got a handful of spells that you never seem to be able to cast, or nothing that you put in your deck seems relevant to what's going on on the table, uh, these points that we're gonna be making, these five points will probably help improve that. And like, like Griff said, these are just our opinions. We don't claim to be the end all know all on Commander and how to make your deck like the best deck ever. This is all just coming from our experience from building decks and our experience of watching other people build decks. And I don't know about Griff. Actually, I know about Griff. He's built a lot of decks. And as of I, and I've also tuned a lot of decks. And I think that last part's really important because I've sat down with a lot of my decks and I've poured over them looking at cards and just being like, okay, this card, I like every time I draw it in a game, it's not relevant. I never play it. And after, after you know, cutting five or six cards and replacing them for better cards, I noticed a significant improvement to my deck. So you'll notice that that would require a little bit of time input to the deck. You'll have to play it a bunch of times. And I believe that there are a lot of people that that fall into that category. So hopefully this is this is relevant. Absolutely. I mean, in the last uh, last episode where we talked about the deck building. The last episode was Reflection. I alluded to the fact that a, building a deck is not just the one time that you collect a, a group of cards and put them together. Deck building is the transformation of your deck over time from the first time that you build it. Because there's going to be a lot of times where like, I need to add more of this type of card. I need to add more of this type of strategic advantage. Like there's a lot of things that you're going to edit and that you're going to add and that's the deck building. So a lot of these points are going to help you deck build over time and make your deck stronger. So again, the we like to think of these things as fundamentals, these five fundamentals of making your deck stronger. And just one last thing to note before we, we get into these five fundamentals is take into consideration your meta when you're putting cards in. Um, a lot of cards might seem good, but they're really not that great against the decks that you often play against. So we always advise to develop a, a play group if you can. I know not everybody has the luxury of like living next to a card store or living next to all of your friends that are into magic. But if you can, we highly suggest, you know, developing a play group that you play with regularly. That'll, you'll actually start to build stronger decks from that point. Absolutely. So let's go over the five categories. Um, we're just gonna list them off and then go into detail. So, so the first, the first fundamental is simply just the strategy of your deck or your engine or whatever your deck wants to do. Then the next fundamental is ramp and your mana base. After which there's your card advantage slash card draw and recursion. And then you've got your interaction, the ways that you have of stopping your opponents, and then the protection, how you stop your opponents from interacting with your stuff. So let's start with the engine. Uh, like Landon said, the engine is basically the strategy of your deck. What is your deck trying to accomplish? How is it trying to win? And this will differ from each and every deck. However, there's a lot of commanders that have, you, you will see that have similar engines or strategies to them. Name all the themes like off the top of your head. Like, oh gosh, there's too many. many. I mean, how many <laughs> themes are there? Like, like just creature-based themes. Creature-based themes, okay. I mean, we've got tribes, we've got goblins and elves, and we have uh, creature recursion like uh, Marin. There's just so many themes and so many strategies that you mm -hmm. really need to get to the details about what is your engine. Specifically, what are you trying to do with your deck? So let's say, for example, that you have built an elf deck. 
we're probably going to refer back a lot to elf decks just because they're one of the easiest tribes to build. They're really strong. Um, they're really fun to build. It was like one of the first decks that I built was an elf deck. One, one thing that like you'll learn is there's there usually is like a best asterisk best commander for your strategy. Mm -hmm. Like when we're talking about elf decks, probably the best elf commander is Azuri Renegade Leader. Um, I mean, Salvala makes a good claim. Salvala, um, I mean, Salvala, yeah, so th there's a lot of, this is a good point too, is that there's a lot of commander decks that allude to the strategy of elves, but like in Salvala's case, Salvala can also go on a different route that mm -hmm. Azuri can't. So again, it's important to figure out what is what is the strategy of your deck. If you're doing elves and you're specifically trying to put elves in your deck, Azuri is probably the best. Or you can play Morrowind if you want to ramp up faster. I mean, Salvala is probably better in a large green beatdown deck. Mm -hmm, definitely. And we're going to um, take an example from Standard. We've got Athreos. That's kind of like a reanimator type deck. And we did a deck tech on him. There are just better reanimator commanders that mm -hmm. exist in the card pool. Like you've got Muldrotha, the Gravetide, and you've got Carador, the Ghost Chieftain, and you've got Marin of Clan Neltoth. Like you've got a lot of options for like really good reanimator decks. But at the at the end of the day, it's whatever you like to play, right? Exactly, it's yeah. but you know if you're trying to build better in a certain strategy, you have to look at other commanders. Think about the commander that you're playing and think about the strategy that you're playing and look at other commanders that are doing the similar strategy and think, is there one that could do this better? Am I playing a Kest deck that is trying to cast more spells on other people's turns? If so, maybe Elsha of the Infinite is a better deck for you since Kest only lets you play on your turns or maybe vice versa. Maybe you have Elsha and you want to switch to Kest because you want a better uh, selection on your turn. That, that's a, a good point that Griffin brings up. You just have to decide on your strategy and which commander works best in that strategy. But there are going to be commander decks where you there is only one strategy with that commander. Like, for instance, my Atemsis deck, there is no other deck that can do what Atemsis can do. There's lots of other blue decks. It's very unique. Yeah. Very unique deck. And, I mean, you have Talran that is another very popular blue deck, but that's a different strategy. So there are some cases where your deck and your commander is the only one that can do that. But... It doesn't hurt to look to see if there is there any other person that can do this this strategy for me like with mm -hmm. life gain or spell slinging or creature recursion or just tribal creatures so the important part of what we're trying to say is despite whatever theme that you're playing whichever tribe you're playing these fundamentals need to be found in your deck they need to be met in your deck and if you can find if you can hit these fundamentals if you can hit the ramp the card draw the interaction the protection um inside your theme even better that'll make your deck and that's what we call synergy right mm -hmm. that just makes your deck that much more synergistic so let's move on to let's say you've picked your theme you've picked your strategy uh let's move into ramp mm -hmm. um should you just be playing any ramp spell in any deck? Should I just be putting Harvest Season or Traverse the Outlands in every... Should I just be like smacking that in every green deck? Is that a good idea? <laughs> Absolutely not. Maybe secure, maybe even secure a Tribe Elder. Does secure a Tribe Elder belong in every single green deck? Or are there decks that it belongs better in? There, I think you brought up exactly is that there are so many options for card ramp and card advantage. And a lot of these selections work better with different strategies than others. For instance, Secure Tribe Elder works so much better in a recursion strategy where you can bring it back multiple times than it does in, um, you know, like an elemental deck, for instance. It'd be kind of random to see. Yeah. Well, like it, in a deck that wants your creatures to die, it works really good in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like Corvold, mm -hmm. Faker's King. And, and for Harvest Season, you need to have creatures in your deck to play Harvest Season. So maybe you're not playing enchantments with, mm -hmm. with like a green-white enchantment deck. So not all mana ramp and card advantage is going to be the same. However, there are similarities between different synergistic strategies. The fact is you just need it. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to like... So it's like you need to look at your deck and look at your your ramp strategy. So what I like to do is just take my my deck apart, separate all the lands from the non-lands, and then try my best to categorize all the cards in my deck. And I start with putting all of my quote unquote ramp spells or anything that gives me more mana than I would have had if I didn't play that spell into a category. I break it down and I look at, okay, which ones are not so great in my deck and which ones work really well? And I try to find ones that work really well. Um, how many lands or mana sources should you be playing in your deck? You should probably start with that too before you start breaking Absolutely. down. Um, uh, you want about 45 to 47 mana sources in yeah, your not, deck. Not lands. You don't want to be playing 47 lands. No. You want to be playing... Um, I mean, there's no... There's I mean, no depending on the strategy. Exactly. But like. Depending on your, your mana curve and, and your average CMC, 
what you want is to have at least is nine or ten mana ramp cards that aren't just lands. Okay, so if you subtract 10 from, let's say, 47, that leaves you with 37 lands. Yeah, 37 lands, which 35, is pretty 35, 37 lands. Again, that depends on your um, your strategy and your mana curve. I mean, exactly. In your cast deck, your CMC, your ever CMC is almost one, so you play 30 <laughs> lands with that, many mana sources. Yeah. So it does yeah, depend on is, your strategy. That, that's true. But for instance, when we look at... at let's take two different decks, for example. Let's take a, a Regnan Krav white and black deck next to uh, like a Kess Grixis spell slinging deck. You're gonna be playing much different mana ramp in one of those than the other. Uh, actually like both, actually I think any color that doesn't, like any deck that doesn't have access to green is probably gonna be relying on mana rocks. Uh, definitely mana rocks and um, different, you know, different type of cards that fit within the strategy. Yeah, well, like, I, yeah, I have seen some spell slinging cast lists that run a lot of rituals mm -hmm. because rituals, it's a one off, you get that mana until the end of turn and it's gone, but it gets your spell count up. Right. And so a lot of spell slinger decks are trying to storm off. So the prospect of playing a spell that adds mana on your turn is a lot more attractive than playing artifacts that just kind of sit there on the table mm -hmm. and don't add to your storm count. Whereas in Regna and Crav, you're looking at like smothering tithe effects. You want Ashnod's altar, Ashnod's altar and Black Market, mm -hmm. things that are working towards the aristocrat synergy that you're going for. Payoff for the deaths, right? Mm -hmm. You want you want death payoff triggers. Okay. And it's gonna be completely different in a Solvala deck, which is mono green, which is probably the best color for specific ramp cards. But oh, yeah, it's the best. I mean, green ramps. Green has the has the widest card selection mm -hmm. pool. Like if we're looking at ramp spells, that's very um, true. But even in, in in green, it's gonna be different than, for instance, a mono green deck is gonna be different than a white green deck depending on the strategy. For Karametra and an enchantment deck, harvest. you're gonna be playing a lot of enchantments that are gonna give you mana, v versus yeah. an elf deck where you're gonna be playing elves that tap for mana. For example, in my Siona deck. The Siona deck deck that I just did, I'm playing a lot of auras that enchant lands, and I'm I'm running some ways of untapping those lands because that's that's a lot of mana ramp right there. And that's the important thing is that you want your mana ramp. The best kind of mana ramp is mana ramp that goes along with your strategy because not all mana ramp is just going to be mana rocks that give you mana. Although those are important, Sol Ring is an amazing card in most decks. However, a lot of your sources should be tailored towards your strategy or your engine because that is going to make your deck even better. Well said. So the next fundamental that every every commander deck that's looking to improve should try and hit is your card advantage. And underneath the umbrella of card advantage, we have card draw, we have uh, creature recursion, we have card recursion from your graveyard, um, casting spells from the top of your library. There, there's a mm -hmm. lot of things that fall into the umbrella of card advantage more than just drawing cards from your deck. I, when I first started playing Magic, one of the places that I hated being the most is playing my commander deck and running out of cards. And I'm just pulling cards off the top of my deck and it's a land, land, and it's the most depressing feeling. And I thought maybe my deck is just, it just can't get there. But most decks can give you a better advantage at drawing cards so you're not stuck in that position many games. I think one thing um, that I've learned about card advantage and card draw is you can never have too much of it, honestly. Like you, you can never put too much card draw in your deck. So let's say for example, you are wanting to put more card draw into your deck. What kind of cards are you looking for specifically? Are you looking for X blue blue spells like Blue Sun Zenith, Pull From Tomorrow? Are you looking for cards like uh, Factor Fiction? I mean, what, what, what do you like to put in your decks? I think if this goes along with the ramp as well, if we look at both ramp and card draw and how they're both very fundamental to our decks, Something that will make your deck even better is to have them tied towards your, your strategy. A lot of card draw are gonna be different for different strategies that you're playing. I mean, even in Solvala, a lot of the card draw that you're playing is just green spells that say draw you cards equal to the greatest power. Or how many creatures you control too, exactly. I've seen. I think Feather is a good example too. Yeah, if you look at something like Feather, like a lot of the cards that you're drawing is just give a creature first strike and draw a card and you're just adding to your cards. Or Feather is just bringing those cards that you're casting back into your hand. Exactly. So, so that's, yeah, that's that's perfect example of card, or card mm -hmm. advantage, we'll say. And if you look at the Heliod deck tech that we just posted, a lot of the card draw that's tailored to the life gain that you're you're using, the artifacts that you can use to put plus one plus one counters and remove them to draw cards. That's very much different than what you're going to be playing in mono green or mono black. Or if you're playing a reanimator deck, um, some of those, not some, most of those spells that say put cards from your library into your graveyard might as well say draw ten cards. You know, because in a Moldrotha deck you have 
very free access to your graveyard. In fact, that's one of your primary resources. So yeah, your graveyard is also your hand. In a Moldrotha, Moldrotha deck, you're probably not going to want to be playing a lot of cantrips, right? Because, you know, why Moldrotha lets you play them from your graveyard. So you right. might as well put things into your graveyard. That's it's, it's a lot better deal. Or in Marin, Marin lets you reanimate things for free. So like, mm -hmm. let's say you've got a big, a big scary demon in your hand that you're never going to be able to cast because it's too much mana. Well, if you built Marin, right, you will never have to cast it. You just mm -hmm. reanimate it from your graveyard. And that's, that's pure card advantage, right? That is, and that also goes back to your, to your, the theme of your deck. So let's, let's look at an example of two different card draw spells in black and why they're different and why you should put these in different decks. The first one is Bankrupt in Blood from Ravnica, which says sacrifice two creatures and draw three cards. And the next one is Read the Bones, which is a sorcery that says draw two cards. Scry two first. Scry two, yeah. draw two cards, lose two life. Now these are both essentially, these are both card draw spells. And you might look at Bankrupt and Blood and think, wow, this is a phenomenally worse card draw spell. Even There's though you're two drawing creatures, three. creatures, a card in your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you look at your your deck and you're like, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna play read the bones in every black deck because this is just better. But think of it in a Moldrotha or a Marin deck where you want to or Corvold, or Corvold yeah. where you want to be sacrificing creatures. Then all of a sudden, Bankrupt and Blood becomes much more efficient. Yeah, in Corvold, that's that actually reads sacrifice two creatures, draw two cards, draw three cards. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually it's actually kind of nuts. But uh, yeah, it's it's different, a little bit different context, right? A little bit different strategy. Um, and some, and that's what's cool about magic, and that's what's cool about commander is you can take cards that seem to have a drawback and use that drawback to actually come out with more advantage on top. And that's like that's one of the reasons why I love commander so much is you can find cards printed in weird sets that you've never heard of that seem to have some stupid downside, but it just fits so perfect into your strategy. Absolutely. So I think that the most important thing to remember about your card advantage and your card draw. The first one is you want to be playing about 10 slots as well for card draw. And even if you're playing more than 10, going to 15 like Landon said, you're not gonna be unhappy having more card draw. The more card draw, most of the time, the better. The second thing is that you want your card draw to be tied towards your strategy. The more synergy you have in the deck, the better your deck is, always. So let's kind of rank, like a rough ranking system for quote unquote card advantage. I think tutoring is probably one of the best forms of card advantage, right? Just being able to go and look for whatever it is that you need, that's really powerful. And your deck could probably always use a tutor of some sort. Um, if you can afford them, there are some budget tutors, depends on your strategy. Next, I would say some type of effect that lets you draw one card per turn is also very good. Cards like Phyrexian Arena, Necropotence, Rhystic Study, um, there are more budget alternatives. I mean, even like some commanders like Afara lets you potentially draw a card every turn. I think that's, those are those are amazing. Probably number two. I mean, I'm not here to tell you that Rhystic Study is good. People know that. Um, <laughs> but like Alms Collector and White. I mean, yeah, anything that can mm -hmm. get you to draw more cards um, consistently. And then looking at like spells that just, you know, cantrips, cards that just basically trade for card advantage one for one. Um, probably should be playing minimal of those. And then probably at the bottom of the card advantage totem pole is rummaging, disc, like uh, looting, stuff like that. That's kind of more card filtering, not necessarily card draw, but some colors take what they can get. All in all, the most important thing is to remember, you need to have card draw on your deck, especially ones that can draw or you like multiple 10 cards. 10 types of card advantage mm -hmm. abilities. Ones that give you multiple cards and ones that work for your strategy and, and synergize with your commander are the best type. But always remember you need to include at least 10 to 15 cards of card draw or card advantage so that you can always have answers, you can always have plays because that's where you want to be and that is how your deck is going to play better. Let's talk about interaction. Landon, why is interaction so important? Because you can't just sit there and let your opponents do things. You have to like just get in there and stop them exactly you, know? you got you gotta you gotta be the iron fist bop throw them in the head. punch them <laughs> i mean this is this is war this is commander commander is is, <laughs> is friendly war no uh games will not last as long if you don't interact with your opponents and your opponents will win before you get to play your stuff so that's why <laughs> Let, let's let's say if you've ever been in this situation you're sitting down with this new commander deck that you just built and you were super excited to play this this commander deck and you draw your hand and in in your hand you have one of the cards that you were most excited to play in this deck and you play your cards you're super excited you're going in and you play this big spell and you're like you know what this I, I'm gonna win the game now because this is just so good. I've built my deck so well and it gets countered. It gets killed. It gets destroyed. Somebody interacts with it and stops it. And now what do you do? 
that situation cry and go home everybody has been in <laughs> your commander is the biggest target for removal in the game and your commander is going to get removed you need to be able to make sure that you can deal with other people's threats as much as people are willing to deal with yours so interaction can come in about just as many packages as ramp and card draw can or card advantage uh plague crafter two and a black enters a battlefield each player sacrifices a creature Fleshbag Marauder. I'm, I'm listing off like black mm -hmm. cards that are in a lot of reanimator decks. Every color Hard is going to be different. Yeah, and that actually, when it comes to interaction, every color um, is more blessed with interaction than when it comes to card draw or ramp, mm -hmm. actually. Like, white is known to have very poor ramp and very poor card draw, but white also can deal with basically any type of card type. You've yeah, got enchantment, good. artifact removal. It exiles the best. It has the most board wipes and, and you have lots of selection. Green has a lot of artifact and enchantment de destruction. It has a lot of... Oh, I mean, you've got uh, Beast Within. That Beast can Within. can basically deal with any permanent. Song of the Dryads, which can really, really, really host somebody see our gameplay video coming out soon. <laughs> um, Crossing Grip, which has split second, which is very difficult for your opponents to respond to, near impossible. Um, so, and that's, we call that like just targeted removal, right? You're trading one resource for one resource, which mm. can be very tempting to put a lot of in your deck, but when you look at spending one spell to remove one thing, when you've got three opponents, that actually becomes a little bit inefficient and you should probably be playing sweepers as well. Yeah, it's not always worth it to use one card for one, but it is in some cases. A lot of times somebody drops a card that will win the game. That's when your one for one is really useful. You need to, yeah. Some, what if yeah. your opponents have a large board of lots of creatures that aren't necessarily great, but altogether they're gonna win the game. Then you wanna have something that can deal with that. So let's say for example, the, the going rate for a kill spell, like a doom blade or a terminate or a dread bore. We'll just say one to two mana. Mm -hmm. um, if your opponent has five creatures and each of your kill spells costs two mana, how much mana are you going to have to spend to kill all five of those creatures? And how many cards? Uh, 10 mana and five cards. So sweepers are a way for you to get more than just a one for one. You can get a one for five, a one for six, a one for 20 in some cases. So cards like, like Wrath Effects, like Wrath of God, or Damnation, or Decree of Pain, or, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. There are so Blast many board wipes. in red. Mm -hmm. In green, you've got a lot of things that can destroy all creatures with flying, if that's pertinent in your playgroup. There are even mass artifacts, hey, like Vandal Blast, or Merciless Eviction is probably one of the most, like, flexible. Mm -hmm. For four black and a white, you can, there are several modes. You can exile all artifacts and enchantments. No, is it all artifacts, enchantments, creatures, or planeswalkers? So you can choose mm -hmm. one of those modes. I think that's it. Yeah. Well, then Cleansing Nova, you know, you can mm -hmm. choose between killing all the creatures or all the artifacts and enchantments. So you, you might want to prioritize more flexible board wipes um, that can deal with different types of things. Mm -hmm. But I think you should probably be playing two to three sweepers. Absolutely. Uh, per deck, I would say. And it's definitely obviously pertinent to your meta as well. If you're playing against your friends and your friends don't like playing a lot of creatures in their decks, maybe they like more spell slingy type decks, then maybe you're not playing as many board wipes. But if you're all playing tribal decks, then suddenly board wipes are much more efficient. So again, Look at your play group, realize what you need, but remember board wipes are gonna be one of your best ways to interact because it's one card for multiple cards. Mm -hmm. Really good interaction. Um, some colors, uh, specifically blue, blue can't really answer artifacts or enchantments. Um, and blue also has a hard time with some creatures. So that's why blue was given counter spells, right? Mm -hmm. Blue is the only color that can Bounce deal with creatures. spells on the stack too. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like you've got like meme cards like Mana Tithe and a couple other like really weird counter spells in non-blue card shells. But like blue has to deal with things on the stack. Like mm -hmm. a lot of times it's as a mono blue player myself, I've played a lot of mono blue decks. I have to make the decision do I want to deal with this card, this pesky enchantment on the stack, or do I want to like wait and see if maybe somebody else answers it? Because you're not the only one at the table that has to deal with things. Also, you can, you know, that's another beauty of Commander is you can be political, right? And that can be a tool. But you want to make sure that you have the resources in your deck Absolutely. to deal with things if nobody else is going to come to your backup. So having interaction in your deck is another fundamental to make your deck even better. And interaction comes in the form of counter spells, targeted removal, board wipes. A targeted removal for different types of permanents. Right. So you've got like artifacts, enchantments, creatures, planeswalkers. All right, and the last one we have is protection. And uh, going along with interaction, the same thing with your, let's go back to our example. Let's say you've played that big spell and you're really happy that you played it and somebody goes and tries to kill it. 
Now having it die, that's the worst situation. But what if we save it? What if we can use car slots to be able to save our strategy, our best creatures, that is gonna be able to make our deck even better. So this goes back to the point that we made at the very beginning of the video about Azuri being probably one of the better elf commanders because one of the weaknesses of a go wide, make lots of tokens, make lots of creature strategy is the eventual board wipe that's going to happen. Like mm -hmm. a board wipe is gonna happen in a game of EDH. And once you've spent all of your resources, dumped your entire hand onto the board, the last thing that you want to have happen is a board wipe. Empty your board, you have no cards in hand, that sucks. Mm -hmm. Azuri is good because he has a waste staple onto him of regenerating your elves, which that's really, really, really powerful. That's fewer card slots that you have to run inside of your deck to protect your strategy. Mm -hmm. So it preserves card quality. Um, so that's something that we, we you really wanna focus on is um, finding ways within your strategy to protect your board is really good. Like um, in your Oketra deck, a lot of the a lot of the protection spells are things that give my creatures indestructible. And yeah. in Perforos, a lot of my protection spells are things that can save my creatures when they're going to die. In Mono Black, a lot of the protection is the recursion. We bring our cards back. In Afara, I do a lot of blinky stuff. Um, making sh like if somebody goes to target one of my creatures i can just blink it comes back in it's a new target and that spill will fizzle and that's just a way of protecting the pieces that i need exactly so that needs that needs to exist inside of your deck and protection i don't know how many protection spells you're going to need to run but i would probably say three to four maybe five in the heliod deck that we released i included six to seven pieces of okay. protection that's, and that's because my deck is heavily creature based which means i need a lot of things to help my my creatures stay on the field but with Yannette, a lot of my protection is in counter spells, and I have 10 to 12 counter spells. Or ways of making Yannette hexproof or shroud. That's mm -hmm. that's another thing I wanted to focus on, is this might seem a little bit weird to place inside of protection, but one way that you can quote unquote protect your strategy is not relying on your commander too much. Um, that's a super good point. You, you don't want to put a lot of cards in your deck that only function when your commander is on the battlefield. Um, I, play, I play CDH, I have a CDH deck and uh, I, it's, I play Kess and I see a lot of people wanting to run the card in Tomb. It's a really good card. For one black mana instant speed, you can search your library for any card and just put it right into your graveyard. And with Kess out, that's basically a one mana tutor, right? And that seems really attractive. But what happens when Kess gets killed with Entomb on the stack? Or what happens when you draw Entomb and like you just, Kess has already died a couple of times earlier on and you just, you can't afford to cast her and cast Entomb. Basically, that's a dead card a lot of the time. Um, there are a lot of cards that I think people run in their decks that are dead outside of when their commander's on the battlefield. And I think you really want to limit those to as minimal as possible. Like maybe one to two. Uh, like, and, and they have to be like probably really, really, really good, like winning you the game good. Um, I think that's, a, that's a, a very common mistake that I see at tables is people will play cards that if their commander wasn't on the battlefield, literally do nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's definitely something really important to remember. I mean, going off again with an example like a Tempsis, you do have to use a Tempsis to win. So your strategy is going to be revolving around a Tempsis, but there's a lot of cards in your deck that are going to help you get there uh, more efficiently and quicker. And a lot of decks, you don't want to trust so heavily on your commander if you don't need to. I would say play cards that are good on their own and get like exponentially better or more useful or have more value when your commander is on the table. Right, think about your strategy. Think about the, the engine that you have. Is this engine only gonna work if your commander's on the battlefield? Can you only make this work if he's there? If that's the case, then maybe you need to play more things that help your strategy outside of your commander. For example, with Atemsis, even though Atemsis is the win condition, the deck strategizes around making sure that when Atemsis comes onto the battlefield, you can win. That doesn't necessarily mean the strategy and the synergy is only relied on Atemsis. She's just the finisher. I'll take my Corvold uh, Faker's Chain deck for an example. We, we've done a deck tech on it. The deck actually performs very well without Corvold. There are games where I don't really need to cast Corvold, um, but when I do, things get out of hand. I mean, like, once I get the setup going and I start making, I start getting my token engines out and I start getting my sack outlets, the value that I get from Corvold is almost insurmountable. It's, it's very powerful. But without it, the deck just is like an aristocrat's deck that already generates a lot of value throughout throughout the game. And I think that every every commander deck has those strategies, right? Like, mm -hmm. I can't think of a deck where you only have to play bad cards because the commander's that good. I mean, that might be what we consider a jank deck, which right. is totally fine. Like, you're totally, you can use those. And you do, actually, you, I've always, you know, jank decks are fun. I do um, think jank decks are fun. But yeah, look at your commander and your deck. 
what what we're talking about is if you separate your deck and your commander and you place them in front of you, what's your strategy? Is it the deck or is it the commander? Because they really should be both together the the win. You shouldn't have just your commander be the strategy or just your deck be the strategy. You want them both to complement each other and synergize with each other. If there's too much relying on the commander, that means once it gets removed, you're out of luck, buddy. Your deck's gonna slow down. So that so just our advice on on that category is just objectively looking at your cards in it. It might sound very easy to say, but there are tons of resources that you can use to find out if a card is just a dead card without your commander or if it's it's good enough to play on its own. There are tons of people that you can ask. We're always here to answer questions, but that is just one thing that you can do to improve the improve your deck and make it more synergistic and more powerful. So just to go over the five fundamentals again, the first one we have is the engine. What are you trying to do with your deck? How are you trying to get to it? Make sure that your deck and your commander are synergistic with each other. Um, look at your commander. Maybe there is a better commander that works for that strategy. The second one is the mana ramp. Is your man are you having and play your mana base? Your, your mana ramp and your mana base. Are you playing enough mana ramp? Are you playing enough lands? Are you using mana ramp that works with your strategy? The third one is our card draw and our card advantage. What kind of card draw are we playing? Is there better card draw? Are we playing enough card draw? Is there card draw that works with our synergy? Are there cards that we are playing that can recur spells from our graveyard? And then just look over your interaction. Are you playing a diverse enough uh, interaction package? Are you able to deal with artifacts and enchantments? Are you able to deal with massive board states? Are you able to deal with, you know, one for winning problematic creatures? Are you playing, you know, enough counter spells? Think about your, your play group. Think about the decks that you play on Friday nights. Think about your deck. If you look at your deck and all the cards, think about if there's if this person sits down with this strategy, is there any card that in here that can deal with that? You want to make sure that your deck can deal with most strategies or most types of problems that come up. So after your interaction, look at your protection. Make sure that you're running enough cards that can either keep your commander alive, keep your strategy alive. You know, if you're playing a lot of creatures, find ways of um, like Heroic Intervention, I'll just mention that card off the top of my head. There are a couple other cards that can protect your board from a sweeper, protect your board from targeted removal. So just in conclusion, these are the five fundamentals that we have found just from honestly looking at my, looking at our decks, looking at my decks. I found this theme in all of them. I'm not going to claim to be a master deck builder, but I have found these to improve my decks and I've had a lot more fun. So I'm not going to promise that your decks are going to be winning every single night, but maybe they'll be performing better and that you're going to have more fun playing the deck and you're going to enjoy what it does. Just want to restate that this, Lan and I are just two bubs trying to share our opinion with the world, but just remember that is it's our opinion. This is not going to be a end all know all. It, these fundamentals are not going to apply with everybody over every deck. These are just our opinion of what is going to help you make your deck better when you bring your deck to your playgroup or your Friday Night Magic. And with that, that's the close of the episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. We appreciate your guys' support. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more deck decks and hear us talk even more and ramble on about other f subjects <laughs> pertaining to EDH. Uh, we'll keep doing it if you keep liking and subscribing. Make Thanks, sure guys. to go or make sure to go check out the first episode of our new gameplay series, Duel of the Peaks. Episodes we'll be releasing every month. And one more thing, you guys are great. Thanks so much. Have a great night. Hope you draw well. May you curve out later, guys.